Today our outcome is to set SMART goals. That's specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and time-based. That's the definition of a SMART goal. So together, Bob and I are going to uh, walk people uh, through the process of uh, setting up uh, a SMART goal. Actually, before we get into that, Heath, let's just talk about the relevancy of a goal. So um, I just read a, a recent article about goal setting and how effective it is. But a, a major study was done of major executives in corporations across the United States. And they found that only 3% of corporate executives actually have written personal goals. 3%. Well, 97% um, either have no goals at all or they have um, goals in their head. They actually don't actually take the time to write them down. One of the things we know that's a really powerful um, uh, stimulus towards achievement is actually taking your thought and writing it down. What that does is it releases a chemical in the brain. Well, so you're more apt to um, do that goal, to take steps towards the goal. So um, goal setting is a proven method. Writing goals down is a proven method for you to take action. Not writing goals down is a proven method of not, of probably not taking action towards those goals. Well, you know, it's really interesting what you just said, Bob, because the fact is, is that a thought is it real or is it not? A thought, a dream, only becomes real once we decide. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that decision is made evident by documenting it. 90% yeah. of the journey is the space right. between our head right. and between our pen. Right. And the ability to get it out on paper is, um, it, you basically do it five times over just writing it out. Mm -hmm. You've thought it. You've written it, you've reread it, right? You then go through the whole process of making it real. And once it's physical, it's actually tangible. This is so good because if you take that physical thing and you stick it in a, in a drawer or a closet, that's one thing. But if you actually keep it out on your desk or attach it to your wall or put it in a, your journal, it becomes even more a powerful tool. Yeah. You're constantly reinforced. You're moving towards something, and you will unconsciously take steps towards achieving that goal. So you can, if it's right in front of your face, you can take pragmatic, practical steps each and every day, or your brain just naturally, because it's releasing those chemicals, will read it, and you'll start to take unconscious action towards achieving those goals. Well, one of the laws of focus is that what you focus on grows. And when you are repeating it to ourselves each and every day, um, I use, I call them incantations, incantations every day. And I use them to repeat the things that I want to instill into my uh, mind, mm -hmm. which therefore allows me and helps me overcome fear. And ultimately, the reason most of us don't write down goals is because of the fear that if we make it real, we might fail. Right, and the emotions that go with that when we start to fail or think that we're failing, i.e. let's say if we set a goal to lose five pounds in a month or something like that, and we revisited that goal, we've actually gained two pounds. There's a part of our brain that clicks in and our, we start to feel poorly or badly about not achieving that goal. And this is maybe a logical response, but it's also an improper response to that goal. Well said. Yeah. I, we've all heard the phrase, Baby steps. I think for me is I have a tendency to uh, bite off more than I can chew, and then I just keep chomping like crazy so that I don't choke on it. But the fact is, is that I write down my goals, and we've talked about it, and we're going to talk about it probably in everything we ever do. Is that there's no such thing as failing. It's just a fantastic adventure and learning and. I think the key for us today, as we're going to discuss this SMART goal concept, is that we start with a baby step. So what is the goal that you would really, really like? So for me, uh, I'm a type 1 diabetic, and as a type 1 diabetic, I have to self-manage my insulin, I have to manage my food, and I have to manage my exercise if I made it really simple in the three things that I'm doing. Uh, like driving a car, you got to decide where you're going, you got to know how much gas it's going to take, you got to fill the car up with gas, and then you got to 
go, right? So I just want to reiterate a little bit here on what a SMART goal is. So what is the overall goal that I want to achieve? Let's, as Bob said, let's talk about losing five pounds. There is nobody in this uh, world that couldn't use the benefits of losing five pounds. What it does for our energy, for our overall health, and for our performance. It makes you lighter, which makes it easier to walk, to run, to do all kinds of activities, to fit into clothes, and I can go on with the list. But we gotta set a, a realistic goal. We don't say we wanna lose 50 pounds. No, we have to start with the first pound, right? So let's set a realistic goal that say over three months, we are to lose five pounds. That's specific. It's a measurable, Right? It might be achievable. It's achievable. Might be achievable. Yeah, it's achievable. <laughs> that we're going to talk about with our rituals and the habits that we're going to talk about next. But is it relevant? Yes, because it's a step on the way along our journey. So with that being said, um, and then time. It has to be time oriented. Open-ended timetables get nothing completed or nothing done. So it always has to have a time a due date, a completion date for it. And guess what? If I don't hit the five pounds in the time I've set, and I only lost three, I'm still three pounds lighter than what I started with. Mm -hmm. So there is no fail. Right. It's about progress. Progress, it's also about uh, learning about that goal and all that it takes to achieve that goal. So losing five pounds is actually quite a complex process. Um, so you can lose five pounds um, uh, one way, but to sustainably keep it off means that you have to take probably, well, several different actions in order to do it sustainably over time, right. for sure. And, and for any goal that we set, whether it's uh, to start a new business or to become stronger or to build a better relationship with a family member, whatever the goal is, there's always a series of actions that we would want to take and we have to learn about that. We have to learn about what works, what doesn't work, um, uh, what, well, yeah, what we actually have to do to, in, in order to achieve that goal. So to set a goal, let's talk really quickly then about the three things that we have to do. First, what is the outcome or the benefit that we want to achieve from that goal? Right. Well, and some of these outcomes might be improved energy and health. It could be uh, losing weight. It could be gaining a fitness uh, uh, ability or uh, a level. It could be better, social life. Better insulin management. Right? Insulin management, the eating uh, uh, times. I want to just be on time with my eating and not skipping meals, which people don't realize. Eating less is important, but skipping meals at the wrong time actually can put fat on. And we can talk about that as well at another later date. Just to have more energy. Yes. To be uh, not exhausted during the during the evening or during a certain period of the day. Yeah, learning better shopping habits so that you, in the process you don't end up with a whole bunch of food in the fridge that isn't good for your health. Uh, how do you just reduce stress? Everything in life comes back to stress. And, and the reason I think that it's important to talk on that is stress in itself is a fruit of a word called fear. Stress only comes when fear is present. Very true. So I think it's important that we quickly touch on that with building our SMART goals. We have to have the ability to understand what fear is and then how we can kill fear. Yeah. Right? So fear is false evidence or events appearing real. That's my acronym that I use for it all the time. Um, I didn't create that. As we all know, it's been around probably since the beginning of time. But um, ultimately our fears drive and come from beliefs that we have about ourselves, about a circumstance, or about uh, a specific uh, uh, activity that we have learned from someone else. Because truthfully, we are only born with two fears. The fear of loud noises and the fear of falling. Those are just put into us, into our, our dinosaur brain and uh, from God and other than that, everything else is learned. But our brain is divided into three distinct separate parts. And so there's something called the primitive brain. 
So when faced with any kind of a dangerous situation, um, that all logic goes, all emotions go, and those are the other two parts of the brain, uh, big parts of the brain, and the fear part or the primitive brain takes over and you may have to make a decision whether to fight, that's where conflict comes from, mm -hmm. or flight, which Correct. is the fear part, right? It's a learned skill to face your fear. Right. It doesn't come naturally. All of us, I don't care who you are, whether it's a soldier on the front lines, a police officer, uh, a student learning to go up to the teacher the first time and ask a question as to why did I get this mark? Uh, that confrontation, that willingness to step up and ask. The, uh, the part that links with that, so interestingly, is the second part of your brain, which is where your emotions are, are harbored, right? All of your, um, your, inter uh, your anger emotions, your joy emotions, your, uh, there, I think there's 35 different emotions. We'll talk more about that as, uh, as this series goes on as well. But the emotions are very closely linked to that. So let's say that um, you have a person and you'd like to lose some weight. And, but you find that you're snacking late at night. There may be, uh, the primitive brain may be associated with that, and also the emotional part of the brain may be associated with that. You've probably heard of emotional eating. Oh, maybe <laughs> once or twice. <laughs> so that's, that's your brain kicking into dry, it, uh, that's your primitive brain, the, uh, the fear brain, plus the emotional brain working together um, and overcoming the needs of the logical brain. And that's your front part of your head. Uh, that's, uh, that's the logical part of your brain. So what happens is the primitive brain and the emotional brain are very powerful parts of the brain. And they will actually physically hive off um, your ability to connect with the logical part of your brain when you're in those modes. So um, it's a real, it, we, we're, we're telling you this, we're expressing this, and, and there's so much data on this from research. Still a lot to be uncovered for sure. But uh, the, the fact is that logically we think to ourselves, we shouldn't be eating at night, right? We should not be snacking right now. But the, the, your brain overtakes it. Your brain overtakes it and you sit down and you, you open the bag of chips and the fulfillment you get, the joy, the emotions you get from eating that bag of chips um, overpowers the logical part of your brain. Well, it's quite interesting you talk about that. It's, there isn't a single action that we do in our life that isn't fulfilling a need, right? Mm -hmm. Eating late at night, right? That feeling you just mentioned. Well, that feeling is a need for certainty, mm -hmm. comfort. Mm -hmm. uh, quite often, the going to the gym or, or working out, well, that's meeting my need for significance, mm -hmm. that I matter, that I can be better, I can grow. So all of us have these six human needs that drive our beliefs, that drive our, our meanings, and ultimately the emotions that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. And we will go into depth on the six human needs, uh, those of certainty, variety or uncertainty, uh, significance, and love and connection. Those are our primal needs. And these are the ones that really drive our emotions that you're talking about. Then, where our fulfillment comes from is growth and contribution. That's growing and giving. So, as we go through the process of setting SMART goals, that awareness and understanding that if we're willing to actually not run away mm -hmm. from our emotions, mm -hmm. but ask the question, what need is being met right now by my emotion, it will bring such awareness to us. And as we go through this journey of setting new rituals, of breaking old habits and creating new habits through the rituals that we, we do, that is what's going to ultimately drive the results that we're desiring to achieve. And in the example we've been talking about today, losing five pounds. Right. So how do we use our brain, our emotions, to break old habits and replace them with new ones? And, let, and, and that's a fantastic question. Let's talk about that for a second. So habits are often a physiological response to um, what drives chemicals into those parts of your brain. Right. So I'll give, I'll give you an example. Many, many years ago, I used to drink pop, back in my 20s. Yep. And um, it, I, a cold pop hitting my tongue, right, hitting the mouth, uh, the, the 
fizzy, bubbly, sweet, did something that trait that did something physically to me that I I would start to crave. It. Yes. So you start to crave that feeling, and it's it's basically the chemicals being acted in your brain, um, uh, the, the primitive brain and the emotional brain, which gives you a, a feeling of satisfaction, a feeling of happiness, a feeling of joy. These these are those emotions, right? You get them. logically that's um, what. 150, 200 calories for the small bottles. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> what I think there's 16 different teaspoons, 16 teaspoons of sugar or tablespoons. I'm not sure which one. Yeah. Um, Average one's about 38 grams of carbs within a single can of uh, Coke, as and, an example. Yeah, and 16 teaspoons of sugar, man, or something like that, right? It so it's like crazy. It's that's crazy. Would you ever drink? It's like, drugs. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's chemical <laughs> chemical reaction in the brain. So that habit. That became a habit. It's like, oh, I gotta pick. So you go shopping. You pick up a case of pop, two cases of pop, three cases of pop, right? You stick them in the fridge, and then you uh, during you get the, that short high from the, that well, pump of energy. Well, during the day you're stressed. Things happen. Phone calls are made. Things happen in the family. So what do you do? I'm thirsty. So you go, you get you get your little shot, right? Yeah. And all is well for that, for the popper, whatever yeah, it is. For that 30 minutes. And, and, well, that's the habit, man. So that becomes the habit. Agreed. You, you're driving in the morning, each and every morning, you're driving, you stop it. Where do we stop? Can we, Three million Canadians a day, Tim Hortons. Double, double, buddy. Double, yeah. double. Well, Bob, let's just talk a little bit about coffee. It's a habit that I know I have. I love coffee. As a diabetic, you know, it's one of the few things that we can have. However, if you go in and have a coffee with the double double, that's not the best thing for us diabetics. You got the milk, which has lactose, and oses, as we all know, are sugars. And then you add the other white chemical sugar into it, and you're probably just as much as a can of pop within that <laughs> one coffee. That's, what we, that's the way it works. That's right. right. So you and I have talked at, at large about coffee and how I transition off of uh, having a cream in my coffee many, many, many years ago mm -hmm. to a process I went through to, I just drink black coffee. I actually can't handle anything except black coffee. I've become such a coffee uh, connoisseur, I guess you could say. I'm snooty about it. But I really, I really love the taste of coffee. I also noticed an immediate impact when I did that. I lost five pounds. Yeah, that's interesting. That's quite interesting. And, um, and that's the power of a habit. It is. That's the power of identifying one small thing, maybe a large thing actually, one large thing, and and making a determined effort to um, to change that habit. And uh, I want to talk to you about actually the time it takes to change a habit. A little short story in coffee. When I did that, the exact same thing is I decided to cut the cream out of my coffee. I actually counted the number of coffees that I would have black. So I went from two creams and two sugars to black coffee, just like that, right? Yep. So I said, that's it, I'm done. And it took me 23 cups of black coffee. I didn't like the first one at all. I didn't like the second one, I didn't like the third one. But on the 23rd cup of coffee, I went, hmm, this is quite good. And I, my something happened. Something physically happened to me where I just started to really enjoy coffee for the sake of coffee. Well, I find that interesting, right, because the number you use is quite interesting because to break a habit takes approximately 21 days. 22, depending on the report, the study, etc. Interesting, because I had 23 cups. There you like go. 23 days. That's what I was saying, quite interesting. Yeah. So uh, for us to break anything, it requires consistent effort. And what we're going to be talking about through the course of the Uncommon Diabetic Life programs and, and the challenge that we're on is consistency and committing to a goal is part of it. It's not about if you're gonna slip off or have a good day or a bad day. The fact is just accept it and say, you know what, it's okay. I made it four days, I made it five days before I had cream in my coffee. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Then you get right back onto it and go. It's the fact that we don't allow it to continue. That continuous, consistent, doing of something is what actually creates the habit. So it takes that 21, 22 days to break it. It takes approximately 66 days 
just over two months, to ingrain the new habit. And that means with consistent effort, excuse me. So once that 66 days has happened, we will be seeing results already. During those 66 days of, of transition and transforming our habits, but the real growth where the hockey stick happens is between the 66 and 90 days. That's when we start to see the fruit of our effort. Mm -hmm. So Bob, one thing else that I've noticed and we've talked about before about the brain is a system called the reticular activating system. And you kind of alluded to that even in the coffee side of things. And as you go and you uh, try something new, We'll use the example of buying a new car. So you're out looking at a new car and you go uh, jump into a, a Affinity and then you try a BMW and then you finally make that decision, right? On the uh, Acura. And now you're driving down the street and you see Acuras everywhere, everywhere you go, mm -hmm. right? So our brain has a system. It's called the reticular activating system. And that part of our brain finds things that are similar to what we believe, what we think are thinking about to help us prove something. So a little exercise that you can do sometime is close your eyes and think about red. Just repeat, red, 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 red. Then open your eyes and look for all the red things in the room. You'll be amazed at how many things pop up. Things you've never noticed before. Exactly, that you never noticed before. Mm -hmm. Then, you also will notice that in the process of doing it, that that brown color actually became a little bit reddish brown because we want so much to find the red that we even start to even lie to ourselves that that reddish brown it could be called red yeah you see what i'm saying so it's a really powerful part of our brain so maybe let's dig a little bit more into the habits and the process of creating them and let's talk about one such as well we're talking about no. we're talking about this because um in order for any change to occur we have to have a goal we have to have a, a big picture goal right and then we're going to take actions towards that goal now it's up to in each individual to decide how big that goal is. So we're talking about five pounds, but there's no reason on why you leave, why you couldn't set that goal at twenty pounds or fifty pounds or whatever whatever the weight is, right? That's really powerful what you just said. So, and I have a tendency, like one of the things that I've done this year, which is quite exciting, was I decided to go on this this uh, big camping trip, right? You carry sixty pounds for five days, right into the mountains, uh, up to eighty five hundred feet. And so I had to get in shape for that, like to do that. So yes, that was a six month goal. Uh, and I knew that I'd have to be very, very strong legs, strong back, right? I had to be strong for that. So I had to, so that's the goal is to be able to do that and not be injured on the trip. There's a, a series of actions and activities that I had to work out to, in order to get that, you know? So, um, so those, the, that's what we're talking about. We're talking about diabetic performance, we're talking about becoming uncommon, we're talking about taking a challenge, setting a challenge for yourself. It's also becoming the person that you were meant to be. Yes. Right? We find ourselves in different periods of life where we're looking, we go look in the mirror and we go, geez, you are old. Jeez, you're not, you're, I'm not at the place I need to be with my relationship. I'm not at the place where I need to be with my with my career. I'm not at the place where I want to be with my body, right? That's right. But this, this is life, this is life, ups and downs. It's really good at certain periods of our life to, to, to say, I was not, I need to be better. I want to be better. I want to achieve more. I want to change something, right? So I think there's lots of data, and I'd like you to speak on this, Heath. There's lots of data that shows set a high goal, Yes. Right? Set a high goal. Something that you really want to achieve. And I think the, the analogy is if you shoot high and you miss the target, you're still going to be high. But if you set the target down low and you miss the target, you're going to be low. You know, the old, the old saying is better to shoot for the stars and hit the barn than aim for the barn 
and hit the pig pen. Need <laughs> your foot. <laughs> <laughs> so I think at the end of the day, what you just said is really powerful. I think let's put it into an analogy of a staircase. When we look at the top of the stairs, we say, okay, I want to get to the top of that set of stairs and we're running stairs. Mm. We don't go and take one step and end up at the top of the stairs. There are multiple steps along the way. And the truth is we get to choose, are we going to do it one step at a time? Are we strong enough? Are we fit enough that we can do two or three steps at a time? That becomes a pattern though, that will repeat itself throughout the climb mm -hmm. to the stairs. Mm -hmm. So each one of us has to dream. Ultimately, it comes down to this. If you want to do it, I have an acronym for ideal. First, we have to say, I want it and I'm accountable to achieve it. Mm -hmm. Then we've got to take that dream and make a decision. That's the D. That's the D. <laughs> that decision gets documented. We just talked about that earlier. How important, 90% of the journey. But that goal, the doing of the dream comes from reverse engineering from the destination that we ultimately want to, to what is the steps that we're going to take mm -hmm. and in what cadence along the way. Yeah. So as an example, we set the goal to go up 10 flights of stairs. Mm -hmm. We only have to worry about the first step. So we start at the top and we re-engineer it down and say, here's the 10 steps that it's going to take to get to the top. And we focus on step one. Well, let's take a look at this. Let's take an example at this point in time because this is important. Is what are you pressing now, Muscle Man? Oh, what am I pressing? Um, well, uh, at the gym, I'll just use dumbbells. Um, my max that I've done for ten so far would be hundred pound dumbbells. So those are big, man. <laughs> those are the best I ever did was ninety. Yeah. Right. Those are big. Do you have a swatter for that hundred? No. Whoa! <laughs> Where did no. you start at? Well, I started about sixty, right? And in the essence, are you talking about what my circuit no, no, is? Or? No, when, well, back when you were uh, when you weren't lifting regularly. When you oh yeah, you'd be forty pounds. Forty, right? 40 pounds as a dumbbell uh, uh, when you when I started, and that's just process. You're right. Yeah, I like what you're that's saying. The it's, it's that's the, the steps. Step. So start with the I, which is yeah. I want to be able to. I want to be strong. That's right. Right. I want to be strong. You made a decision. I'm going to the gym. That's right. I yeah. want to be able to lift. 100 uh, pound dumbbell right on. press, right? right? I've made the decision and I documented it with a workout plan. Mm -hmm. Then I have to do it. I've got to get off my butt, <laughs> off the couch and go to the gym. Do you actually put it in your, in your phone? I do, yes. So, so, so scheduling do I. it, so do I. scheduling things is really an important thing. Then after- You'd be shocked at how many people want to be fit but never put an appointment in, in the, the calendar. calendar. That's true. Well said. You'll put an appointment for your business partner. You'll put an appointment for, for dinner. A client. You'll put an appointment for, but you know, to go to a movie or go to dinner. That's but it. But they won't put their fitness stuff in the, in the Agreed. Calendar. So I think this comes back to our chunks, right? The mm -hmm. big chunks of our life and putting the rocks that we feel are really important. Because ultimately, if we don't take care of ourselves, we can't take care of anybody. Mm -hmm. And health is a crown that only the sick can see. If we don't take time to take care of our health now, and all we're going to focus on is other things such as making money. Eventually you're going to have lots of money and no health and you'll spend all your money on trying to get your health. Mm -hmm. So why not create a, a path that we can have both, right? Or whatever it is that you want in your form of life. Um, so actually an interesting side note, which, uh, <laughs> which be, it's, we, we also talk about proximity and hanging out with people that give you good ideas and inspire you and, and can change your thinking and can help you set goals, right? So just listening to Heath, because we've never talked about this before, just listening that he can uh, bench uh, dumbbells at 100 pounds 10 times. Now, I, right now my max is 75, but just hearing that he can do 100, this little scrawny guy can do 100, is actually inspiring me to get up there because I've been looking at the 90s. I've been looking at the 90s and going, oh, uh, those are heavy. <laughs> but I mean, that's, that's the power of goal setting. That's the power of proximity right there is hearing somebody else uh, tell them tell them your story, somebody you respect and admire, and all of a sudden it's like, hmm, why, why couldn't I be doing 100? Like, of course you can. Of course I can. Of course I can. So, I'm just lazy. And I, I haven't set those goals. I have not team. set those goals. 
I'd set the goal for 75, I achieved 75, and I've been slacking in here for six to eight months. <laughs> oh, great. So now I get to push his buttons. I love it. So I got fodder for our fire. So I think that what you're really talking about, though, really comes up to a thing called team. Team is about together, everyone achieves more. Mm -hmm. You need, I need, we need to be around people that are going to empower us, that are gonna uplift us, support us, and hold us accountable, right? So Bob just mentioned, we gotta schedule it. You gotta put the big rocks in first. So when you create a ritual, you have to decide what's the outcome, the result that I want. You then gotta know really clearly, what's the reason? Why, what's my purpose for that, right? Because if the reason isn't big enough, something that has a bigger reason will knock it off the priority list. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So be clear, right? If you need to lose weight, or if you need to uh, uh, start going to the gym, or if you need to show up to work on time, it doesn't matter what it is, you need to have a clear reason. That then is gonna make the rituals or the actions that you need to take important, right? So that's really it, it's three steps. What's the result or outcome you want? What's the reason, right? Or the purpose for doing it? And then what's the rituals or actions that you need to do to achieve it? Mm -hmm. So for us to begin to break old habits, such as sitting on the couch and watching TV and eating versus getting up and going for a walk, right? With your significant other, with your children, with whatever it is that you're doing, do it. But it requires being around people that believe and feel the same way because proximity is i call it my second most important law the first law is what i'm focused on because that ends up driving me to who i'm going to be in proximity to so if i'm focused on achieving a goal right of mm -hmm. lifting 100 pounds mm -hmm. the most ideal thing to do comes back to the question well do you have a spot the best way to have a spot is to be going to the gym with somebody. To have a buddy that you can do something with is powerful. Mm -hmm. You get to uplift them in the achievement of their goal, and they will uplift you in the achievement of your goal. It doesn't even have to be the same goal, right? So, for example, for me, I train for golf, I train for uh, overall strength, I train for um, uh, maintaining a uncommon level of fitness so that my diabetes will not control me i will control it so that i'm empowered to go and do whatever it is whether it be running a half marathon playing in a golf tournament doing whatever i have the skills and the abilities and the physical strength to be able to do that just because we're diabetics or just because i'm overweight or just because i can go with the older because is doesn't mean we can't change mm -hmm. change starts with that first thought that right and then we got to seize it well let's actually just reiterate that first part of the lesson of today which is our brains so that first thought might be i gotta lay down on the couch and eat some chips that's you and your dinosaur brain fighting each other so often we don't go out for the walk we don't uh eat properly we don't shop properly we don't do the things we want to do because and we feel we feel bad because i failed myself but it's really you and your dinosaur brain wrestling. So Correct. that's what we have to do is we have to realize that our brains, um, our dinosaur brain may want us to shut down. And so it's like me against the brain. So that's that could be motivation for a lot of people to get up off the couch is to, is to beat the brain, man. Beat your own brain, get up. And as soon as you get up, as soon as, you, as soon as you get your running shoes on just for that walk around the house, walk around the block, um, you're on the way. Well, and again, I don't think uh, uh, cold turkey is probably the best way to do most things. So as an example of, that you just used, the potato chips, uh, building the couch potato body, sitting on the couch and eating potato chips, uh, all of us have been guilty of that. Mm -hmm. However, I love chips. I do. The number one it's snack. Uh, man. Uh, salty <laughs> stuff. Agreed. So the point being, though, is that if we as uh, people realize you got to accept the fact that you have a habit. Whether you like it or not, that is a pattern. Mm -hmm. So, before we actually completely break the pattern, 
maybe we just change what it is we're snacking on. Almonds. Bingo. I've changed Change almonds. carb to a protein. So we still are in the process and we're tricking the brain so that it's going, okay, I can deal with this, right? You haven't gone and jumped off the, the mountain. You've, yeah, and then now you're substituting in a good protein, which is going into your bloodstream slower. And yes, it's still gonna raise your blood sugar, but the point is it's a better protein uh, than carbs going in before you go to bed. And you don't have to go cold turkey. You can go salted almonds to start. <laughs> and right. then go raw almonds next, right? So right. you can go that graduated thing. And at the end of the day, it's just like my black coffee analogy. The raw almonds are awesome, man. <laughs> and by the way, just so you know, I eat salted nuts. Salt is something that has been given a bad name uh, true. in health. True. And because without salt, your body actually won't retain water appropriately. Without salt, your muscles and, and the electrolytes in your body, well, you can't perform it at peak performance. So there's uh, uh, too much salt, yes, but the truth is is that we don't need to be afraid of it as much as uh, some studies, some have, studies have shown. shown. Because we can do myth, studies. A lot of myth on salt. That's right. We need to find for each one of us what works, right? Because what's good for Bob and his salt intake can be completely different for me. And that's why what we're going to talk about is setting your own mm -hmm goals, your own habits and rituals, respecting others, but at the same time, acting on yours to find out what really works for you and what your body is telling you, right? Mm -hmm. So, where do we go from here, Bob? We've been talking about the uh, how fear and our basic and our, and our dinosaur brain is driving us. We've talked about how the frontal uh, lobe and our, and, our, and our logical brain is working in a particular activating system. How are these going to apply in the actual implementation of breaking the habit, replacing it? Because now you've you've broken a habit. Now you got an empty hole. You mm -hmm. got to fill it with something. Because mm -hmm. we are consciously or subconsciously creating habits all day long. Everything you do is creating a habit. Right. Right. And those are all fulfilling a need mm -hmm. of one of our six needs. Right. So it takes a time to start to go, holy crow, what about all this stuff to, to put it in? Right. You start with one thing. We know we're going to set a goal, a big, hairy, ostentatious goal. BHAG is the one funniest ones I ever heard right. on that. And it's got to be big. Then why? What is that reason we're going to do it? Mm -hmm. Right? You want to get back to where you were. If you're uh, like us in the 50s and 60s and we go, I want to make my 50s 30s and the truth is I can outperform most 30 year olds in the gym or on the golf course or wherever the body only does what we train it to do and it's only limited by what we think we can do and I guess the mind is the same isn't it it is yeah. it is it all comes back to our beliefs mm -hmm. and being willing to confront our beliefs mm -hmm. and say where did that come from so I think, I think this is where the Uncommon Diabetic, and this is why it's, it's, uh, you've uh, founded it, Heath, is um, to be helpful. Because setting a goal on our own and uh, achieving it on our own, it's very doable, very doable. But if you, as you mentioned, if you can find a buddy to take to the gym, it's more powerful. The buddy calls you up, you get off your butt, you go with him, right? That's what the Uncommon Diabetic is about. That's what the 21 Day Challenge is about. So we would like to challenge you to uh, get in touch with us, right? You can go to our YouTube channel, you can go to the Instagram channel, you can go to our website and um, join, join, join the club. Uh, we've got um, support groups, we've got experts on diabetes, we've got experts on nutrition, we've got experts on fitness, we've got experts on weight loss management. There's all this information and support that's available. Yeah. So. At the end of the day, the Uncommon Diabetic Challenge is about challenging you to break the old habits and replace them with new. And the process of doing that is pretty much what we just laid out, right, in, in our conversation. I'll say it one more time. Be really clear on the results that you want. If you think it, you can do it. Two, what's the reason? Make it a big one. Then, what are the rituals or actions that I need to change, break, and instill 
to do it. And if you want to achieve a goal, you need to get around people that are like you, striving to do it. Because those of a feather flock together. What you're going to notice is that people, whether it be an economic, physical, mental uh, activities, end up grouping around people on a similar journey. Different stages, such as I've run a half marathon. There's all shapes of body types, all levels of fitness, but we're all runners, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right? And some are run walkers. The point is they're finishing and setting a goal and finishing that outcome. And the respect that we have as a whole in that. And there's people, it's their first one, it's their 50th one. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter. Being around those people empowers you, yeah. lifts you up, and will move you forward. And at the Uncommon Diabetic uh, Challenge, as Bob just said, we're welcoming you to join us, to face your fear, surround yourself with experts, surround yourself with peers, and be willing to be vulnerable, share your dream, and get the support and the guidance that you need to achieve it. Because together, everybody achieves more. So, now the other thing that we, the other thing that um, the Uncommon Diabetic has for you is some assessments. Some, um, in order for you to decide what you, when you decide what you wanna do, it's, it's really important to figure out what you're doing right now, to take a, a hard, clean, third party look at where you're at with your things like how much activity you're doing, how much water you're drinking, how much, what your nutrition's like, what, you, what your current eating habits are like, what your alcohol consumption like, as examples. So we've got a series of assessments available to you at, at the Uncommon Diabetic, where you can go in and take a look at, uh, at a good meal plan, uh, but also just capture your own meal plan and compare it to what, um, what, what might be available. It also gives you opportunity and knowledge about how to create a meal plan for your body type, for your, uh, for your weight, for your gender, for, uh, for, to, for you to factor in all those sort of things that make, to make it very special for you. As Heath said over and over, we're all individuals, we're all on our own plans, um, but um, uh, the, the process of figuring out what works for you, for your insulin management, for your, um, for your maximum energy during the day to recharge your batteries, that's a big part of what the Uncommon Diabetic helps you with. Right. And I think, you know, it all comes down to energy, health and performance and learning to work with a group and to have realistic goals is important because you said something really important. I just want to touch on is that, you know, the different types of body, uh, three types of body types, uh, mesomorph, that's the muscular uh, style, the one that is shaped like a V. You have the uh, ectomorph, that would be the tall, thin, uh, we jokingly call it the bean pole look. And then you have the endomorph, which is more the uh, pear or the uh, um, uh, more likely to be challenged with uh, the uh, holding of the body fat uh, in that area. So these are things that you and I and none of us have a choice in. Those are what we were just born with. However, the plans, the goals, and how to achieve your outcomes based on this, the fact that I have a specific body type that will affect the types of diets, meal plans, and the things that have to be done. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, you, it, one does not fit all. Mm -hmm. So if we're looking at uh, the body type, then we have this beautiful thing called a personality that fits within that body type. And there's all sorts uh, with that. There's some that are highly disciplined. There's others that are more carefree and just go with the flow. None of those are right or wrong either, right? Those are formed throughout time. But I want you to know that we ultimately still have a choice and that we can choose to create any form of life that we choose and desire. 
So it just requires that we really decide that plan, that we eliminate anything and everything that's going to stop us from achieving it. And then we automate through rituals and then ultimately just live and learn. That's how you create an ideal form of life. It's just constantly live intentionally focused on executing your plan. And I believe in you. I know because the challenges of my 27 years as a, a diabetic has not been easy. I have good days and bad days. Every I just did a, a podcast the other day on I'm out golfing and I woke up a little bit high and I adjusted and then my sugars went up again. And I ended up in like 19 before I started to play my round of golf. And I just shared my journey of how I managed that and got my sugars back down by the end of the round to below eight and with food, insulin, and exercise, those three components, we can create really good rituals that will empower us to live uncommon diabetic lives. So join us. Join us on the Uncommon Diabetic Challenge. Thank you so much for your time. And it's been a real privilege. As Bob said, check us out under the Uncommon Diabetic on Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, and at uncommondiabetic.com. Thanks so much, guys. Yeah. Until next time. Happy goal setting. That's it. Thanks, guys.